It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 279 of Science on Top. It's Sunday the 22nd of October 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Dr. Shane Joseph. G'day all. And Lucas Randall. Hi. And today we're talking, yet again, about gravitational waves. But this is a really exciting new discovery. So even if you feel like we've talked incessantly about gravitational waves, you will definitely still want to listen to this. And we'll also be talking about how the microbes in your body could interfere with cancer treatments. But first, we want to thank Ryan James, Brett Henry, Dan Kruger, and all our other generous supporters. If you want to help us out, head to scienceontop.com slash donate. So, all right, Lucas, last week we talked about the Nobel Prize being awarded to three scientists who pretty much invented the new field of gravitational wave astronomy. That same week, we learned of the fourth detection of gravitational waves, which was the first time it had been detected by three observatories. And now this week, there's another detection, a fifth gravitational wave detection in just two years. And this is the big one. Why is this detection such a doozy? This is the big one because it's smaller. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Smaller in size, big in things that we have learned. Yeah, so I guess the best way to think about this is imagine a world where you were aware of an ominous rumble that would occur often and you never quite knew what it was because you lived in a cave and you couldn't see the sky and you never ever happened to see when it was rumbling. You never happened to see the lightning that accompanies it. You'd probably have all of these theories as to what causes the rumbling and and who knows maybe you might actually come up with the real you know reason behind what's causing the thunder but if you never saw the lightning you wouldn't really know for sure it would all be theories Mm -hmm. so this is kind of kind of in a way what we've got here we've we've had this gravitational wave detection which was different from the previous ones um because of the intensity was very, very different and the signature was different and the period of time that it lasted was different and it was the expected signature of the merger of two neutron stars, not two black holes, which is what we had seen previously. Now, the exciting thing about this, and just to point out, this is actually exactly the scenario that Einstein had uh, posited uh, would would be um, the sort of detection that uh, would be possible. Um, but what we have found up until now, in the very short period of time, we've had active gravitational wave detectors, which we can now say are actually a thing. <laughs> um, we, we've only um, caught mergers of black holes. And um, part of the reason for this potentially is just because of the sensitivity required to catch a merger of a neutron star, because the gravitational waves uh, produced are, are of less uh, you know, of a, of a lesser strength, mm-hmm. uh, they still will propagate in, in much the same way, but they're not, you know, they won't have as much of an effect. So you need a bigger detector to to detect them. Um, so now with these latest detections, obviously the uh, uh, LIGO and Virgo have have had improvements made over over time. We talked a little bit about that last week with the advanced LIGO, the the you know de- uh, improvements that have been made to the LIGO detector to make it able to detect more um, you know just, I guess uh, less amplitude events. Um, in this case, though, being a neutron star detection, it means that there are multiple pieces of information that reach us where with the black holes all we got were the gravitational waves so do you want to maybe tell us first what a neutron star is sure yeah so a neutron star is basically the leftover super dense remnants of a supernova um, star so a star that exploded in a supernova event will uh, leave behind often a very very dense sort of picture the sort of size of a, of a small city 
um, one that's been touted in the last week of, of coverage has been you know, something around the size of Adelaide, for example. Um, but with the mass of about two of our suns. So this is, this is a, a super, super dense object. And we know, we've known about them for quite some time. Um, that they are, um, uh, that they're the reason or the, the cause of pulsars, which are uh, when you've got these, these objects that are so small, spinning at an incredible rate. And we've, we've talked about pulsars before on the show a number of times. Um, uh, they're spinning at an incredible rate because when, they, when they're that small, they've still got all of the angular momentum that the original um, you know, massive star had when it was when it was uh, rotating. So that 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 momentum is still in the in the object, but now it's a lot lot smaller. So you can end up with pulsars that that give off these pulses in you know um, millisecond sort of uh, frequency, which which you know that means these things are are, are rotating in milliseconds, which is crazy to think mm-hmm. about. Um, so we know, you know, there are certain things that are signature about neutron stars. Now, if you have two of them very close to each other, uh, Einstein had predicted that these neutron stars would give off gravitational ray, uh, waves as they um, basically plummeted into each other in the last moments of their death spiral. And that's basically what we've seen here. But because they're neutron stars, we don't, get, we don't only see them from, the, from uh, you know, the perspective of the impact they have with gravitational waves, we also get to see them with gamma rays, which is awesome because, uh, again, we've known or we've suspected for a very, very long time that these gamma ray bursts, these, these super, super high energy gamma rays um, that only last a couple of seconds, um, we've, we've suspected for a very, very long time that they are actually uh, neutron star mergers that are causing them. Well, now we've got a gamma ray burst detection more or less at the same time as the um, the gravitational wave detection. At the same Which time, in, turn, in the same direction, I think, because now we can triangulate. Like it all just lined up. Gravitational and wave. that's the thing, like, you know, the gravitational wave, we can we can use these things to dial in on the source because the gravitational waves, we've, we've only got two detectors that detected the, the event. So, you know, you can triangulate to a certain degree based on the, the difference in time between the two detections at the different... Um, uh, detectors, and you can say, okay, well, it took you know this much longer to reach this detector, which means it was going coming from that direction. But it doesn't really give you pinpoint accuracy. You just know you know the direction it came from. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with the gamma ray burst, uh, gamma ray burst, we we can dial that in much much closer, and it means that we actually know where this thing came from. So there's actually all of these things that spilled out of this detection, which were just so cool because, as I said, we we now know that yes, indeed. A neutron star merger caused a gamma ray burst of the signature that we've seen before many times, but never known for sure that it was a, a, a neutron star uh, merger. Um, we've got two different types of energy have reached us at the same time, which confirms Einstein's prediction that gravitational waves would travel at the speed of light, as indeed do the the, um, the gamma rays, being electromagnetic. So we've received two things at more or less the same time. Um, this event would have happened, uh, I can't remember the exact number, I think it was something like 180 million years ago or something like that. Uh, I've read a lot in the last sort of <laughs> week of, of different stories and so forth, so figures have not really stayed in my hair. But it was, it was either 130 or 180 million years ago that they, they would say that this event actually occurred. Um, so it's taken that time for these these waves to propagate their way to us. And if you imagine this, like something that was happening in a, in a pond, on the surface of a pond, you would see these ripples that would propagate out, you know, across the pond. Well, turn that into a three dimensional pond with not a surface so much as just this, you know, expanding bubble of um, uh, of gravitational waves and gamma rays and where we are on Earth got hit by both of those edges of two bubbles that were superimposing each other at the same time. So, also, there's, um, there's been long suspected that um, very heavy elements such as gold and lead and possibly silver um, are created during these events. Um, you've, you've probably heard and seen on various TV shows and so forth, if you're into those things, that... Um, that gold is created during supernova explosions. Um, it's it's uh, lo- it's been thought for quite some time that gold is actually created with uh, neutron star mergers, um, and and that has also been uh, observed with uh, with this detection. Although I'm a little hazy on exactly how, 
um, because it's been glossed over with with uh, with regard to the other news. So I, I can't really talk about the mechanism of that detection all that much. Um, but uh, but yeah, that you know, I'm, I'm assuming this is normally you'd you'd look at um, um, either. Um, um, uh, you'd look at spectra and that sort of thing, but I'm not quite sure exactly what they found here I because there, were, there was talk of optical glow and, and light decay as, as a result of gold being a signature or a fireball, but I'm not sure what the detection was that allowed them to, to talk about that. I think they've basically used the data that they detected here and put that into simulations, and that has... Right, that would make more it. sense. Because, That's what I think has yeah, happened. Because I'm not aware that we're actually seeing um, optical light here that we can take spectra from and like that that's not been indicated by anything i've read no i think it was just um, the gamma so, rays yeah cool so uh so yeah um it's it's just it, it's like one of those i don't know some certain games that i've uh, you know computer games and arcade games i've seen over the years where you would you would crack something open and and, and jewels would fall out that were <laughs> useful to you in some way on your quest it's like a whole lot of jewels fell out of this all at the same time which is which is just you know, mega mind blowing, and and you know, as you said at the beginning of the show, if you you know, if you're getting a little bit tired of hearing about gravitational <laughs> waves, bad news, you're going to be hearing about them a lot, um, because there's just so much more that we can do now that we've got this extra tool in our tool set. I mean, I was reading some other um, uh, stories that were um, talking about the uh, the fact that they now give us a very a very accurate measuring tape. For calculating distances to, to to other galaxies, where previously we've relied on on redshift and stuff to um, you know to figure these things out, and and it gives us a, a, a quite a wide error bars as to distances to some of these galaxies when there's not multiple pieces of the puzzle that we can use. We tend to rely on things like standard candles and so forth that we've also covered in the show before. But this is something that is unperturbed by everything else. These gravitational waves are are you know move through space in a in a constant um at a constant velocity so when they reach us and uh um the the amplitude and the the time uh you know the the duration of these uh wave detections tells us a huge amount and we can directly um figure out from that exactly how far away these galaxies are which is just fantastic because that allows us to dial in on other uh, detections of, of other mm. um, um, types of energy and and figure out you know more about that. So it's well, just it's you know, also it, a once way again, to check and verify the accelerating expansion of the universe and that as well. If you have another way of measuring distances, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. And this is something else that's been you know we covered that a little bit I think last week because that was implicated in the gravitational wave detections already. Um, so yeah, it's just, there's so much to, that spills out of this. There's so many little gems that, that help us now in our quest. Uh, and I think it'll be, I think we'll still be talking about this event for, for a while because there'll be more things that are extrapolated out of this than what, what's already been covered in the media. Mm. Um, but also, uh, now, you know, they'll, they'll start to realize what they can, how, how else they can use gravitational waves. And the fact that we're seeing them, you know, with such frequency is just terrific. Mm. Uh, you know, when we have to hang around and wait for supernova explosions, uh, you know, type 1A supernova, for example, as a standard candle to calculate distance to a galaxy, you know, they're not, they're not happening, you know, at, at, in, in huge frequency. Uh, and, and, and we need to be watching to actually detect them. Mm. As the gravitational waves, we don't need a telescope pointed at a particular place to detect the things. Yeah. So that's, it's really cool. Oh, one other thing I'll mention as well, that one of the, um, one of the links that you'll include in the show notes, no doubt, which is the ABC um, mm -hmm. .net AU story has got a um, has got an animation showing how LIGO detections actually work, and it's it's probably the best one I've seen thus far. It's very very clear to me exactly how um, how the detections work now after seeing this animation. So well done to uh, to ABC and the National Science Foundation for putting that together. That's a really cool animation. It's only about a minute long, but it shows you how these two long arms. Uh, with with lasers that are emitted from from you know a single emitter, it's got two lasers that go in two different directions down two different axes, bounce off mirrors and come back again, and because you know the eye in in LIGO is 
is the basically the interferometry. It's the interference between those two light waves, mm -hmm. and because we know light travels as a wave, as uh, it's a particle and a wave. So um, because it's a wave, it cancels each other out when it arrives back at exactly the same time after traveling down these two arms and back again that are exactly the same distance. Um, so normally the detector at the other end doesn't actually receive any light because the two waves cancel each mm -hmm. other out. Mm -hmm. That's the interference pattern. Um, but when one of the arms is stretched and the other one is, is um, uh, compressed slightly, then the two distances are different and then they, the waves returning uh, come back at slightly different times so they no longer cancel each other out and that's why the detector detects them because now it actually sees light. That's just so beautifully simple but it's, it's so goddamn cool. It's so elegant and of course it's the thing that I always find mind-boggling about this is it's detecting the difference of a, uh, less than the width of a proton, the nucleus of an atom, is enough as a signal to detect on that. It's, it's so precise. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it really it really changes the, uh, you know, the old idiom about the, uh, the width of a bee's dick. It's, it's <laughs> wow. Just, it's nothing on this. <laughs> mm. All right. Uh, the other thing I thought was really cool about this is it ha this detection pretty much happened when a whole heap of astrophysicists and particle physicists were at a conference in Washington, D.C., and just after 9 a.m., everyone starts getting all these emails and alerts on their phones. <laughs> They're ducking out of the conference to talk to each other, like, what's going on? We've got to sort this out. We've got to detect this. We've got to look at that. It was very, very cool. That is cool. would have been that is cool, a lot yeah. of adrenaline. You can imagine the buzz that would have been. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and how much would you hate to be the person on stage just after 9 a.m. when suddenly ah. his whole audience is just <laughs> running away to book telescope time. And Dude, that'll be worse than being the guy who was on immediately after lunch. You know, the one that everyone falls asleep yeah. to, you know, <laughs> yeah. to talk. I've been that guy. <laughs> uh, very yeah. cool. Uh, all right, Shane, let's talk to something a little bit more um, frightening, really, uh, and how the mi microbiota on our bodies could actually affect how the anti-cancer medications work. They can lessen the effectiveness of anti-cancer medications. Yeah, um, it's not necessarily the microbiome. Um, it can be just just infections. Um, but what's I suppose what's interesting about this is that um, they have known for a while that so the tum a tumor site is a very strange little place. It's it's not just a mixture of um, cancer cells it's also got healthy cells in it and around it healthy you know human cells in and around it yeah. and apparently in a lot of cases and they specifically they've talked about melanomas in this case the healthy cells will actually release factors that can protect the tumor cells certain you know chemicals not you know as a conscious thing but just as part of their normal machinery and that gets taken up by the well to protect them well yeah or you know just they... part of the in the process of also yeah, protect the cancer. Um, now, this group, this research group, um, noticed who were working on this noticed that no matter what they did, they couldn't get rid of this negate this protective effect, and they figured out very quickly that it was a bacterium, and this bacterium was having the same effect. Uh, a, an organism called Mycoplasma hyorhinus, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, it's a skin infection. And they found that if they so they were doing all these works this this work in the lab they were mixing tumor cells in with healthy cells you know like a tissue culture dish um, and they noticed that they couldn't get rid of this effect and they figured out that yeah if they if they filtered out the bacteria they could stop this effect so this organism was stopping um, the effect of a drug called I think it's called, how do you pronounce this um, gemcitabine I think gemcitabine is how you pronounce it it's a very common uh, chemo therapeutic. Um, now, this organism has an, an enzyme that can break down this drug. For what reason, we don't know. It's, it's probably not, obviously, this enzyme hasn't evolved to do this specifically, but it hasn't. its active site is enough that it can do the same thing. It probably has some other effect than somewhere else, and it just happens to also break down this drug into something inactive. Now, the scary thing about this is that it's not just... Um, uh, just this bacteria that has this, has this gene or a gene like it. They say nine, well, this article says one out of nine known bacterial species. Now, I'm guessing that's ones that they've actually sequenced the DNA of. They've identified homologues of this gene in those bacteria. Um, what's scary about this is that um, 
when they looked at pancreatic cancer patients and the samples from them, they discovered bacteria in 76% of these tumor cells. Now, this is the pancreas. So, what? you know, and also, may, may, may I add, 15% of healthy ones as well. So they, they took healthy pancreas biopsies and found bacteria in 15, 15% of those. So, which surprised me because I didn't realize, I didn't think the pancreas would be susceptible to bacterial invasion that easily. I get, I get why, I get why it would happen no. in a tumorous cancer patient, a, a, a cancer patient, because when you have a cancer, your, your immune system is going haywire, weird things are happening, bacteria find it very easy to infiltrate and get to places where they normally couldn't get to. But in the case of healthy ones, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, that's, um, that has implications down the road, obviously, for, you know, um, using healthy cells for, um, treatment, et cetera, but whatever. Um, you know, <laughs> there's too many problems here to think about apart from just that. Um, so yeah. the quest, so the problem was of these, so of these, um, samples they looked at, 76% had, of the tumors had bacteria. The bacteria that were observed in the cells, they, they detected, it, and it wasn't just that mycoplasma species I was talking about. There were a whole bunch of different ones. And they almost all of them had a similar gene that could break down a gemcitabone. So I assume this isn't something that we can just treat with a course of antibiotics. Um, we can't yeah. just wipe those. That, you could up. do that, but again, you're talking about immunosuppressed patients. Um, a lot of the antibiotics course, probably yes. not a great idea. A and B. In a lot of cases, the microbiome might help with cancer therapy, so you don't want to be wiping out bacteria, especially if it's a broad spectrum antibiotic. Mm. You don't want to be messing with that system. So the the obvious one of the obvious ways it, you could well, one of the – an interesting way of doing it, I think, would be to find a therapeutic that would block the CDD gene that um, does has this effect on the chemotherapeutic. And I'm not sure what this gene normally does. I don't think it's just speci specifically for breaking down a chemotherapy drug, obviously. But – so the question is, if block, by blocking that gene, would you be, you know, doing something else horrible to the other things around it? Who knows? It's, it's, it's not a nice – situation to be in if you're if you've got if you have cancer if you're someone treating the cancer if you're researching it i mean i suppose the other thing is that to look at this, this is just one study now I, I i'm not sure if other if this has been found in other studies there's always a chance of contamination but you know it's probably unlikely if they've been if they're you know if their research is worth their salt and they've done if they've taken every precaution um yeah i mean that and the other problem is that Especially in this case, they looked at pancreatic cancer. Now, this could be the case in other cancers too. As I said, they detected it in a melanoma. They've detected it in these pancreatic ca cancer patients. It could be in other cancers. But the problem with pancreatic cancer especially is that it's it's a really difficult cancer to treat, uh, apparently. So even without these bacterial problems, even with a chemotherapeutic agent, um, it's still hard. So we don't know how much of an effect this is having, if any, really. Um, but it does have implications down the road for things like, well, you know, do, should we be developing new drugs? Should we be making sure that these things can't be broken down by bacteria, for one thing? So, it's, yeah. It's, I'd suggest, yes, we should. <laughs> yeah, but where, but where do you look? Like, <laughs> but the question is how and where do you start? Against? Like, yeah. yeah, you could have a battery of bacteria that you tested against, but you could be missing out on a whole lot of others. I mean, which obviously, you know, it doesn't mean you don't you don't test what you have and what you can test, but still, it's it does it's sort of it's one of those things of well, God, now we've opened up this whole can of worms. What are the other problems that are associated with it? And obviously, mm -hmm. obviously, chemotherapeutics are still effective because otherwise we wouldn't use them. But I do wonder. It it, it makes you wonder how many times when chemo um, chemotherapy stops working, what is what is the why is this is the case is it because of these bacterial contaminations or infections is it something else entirely who knows i just think it's amazing how you know this, these because of the characteristics of the tumor cells with the um with the suppressed you know Im immunosuppressed environment and the the as the story says the leaky um uh, cell membranes and stuff yeah blood, yeah. blood vessels it potentially makes them a, like a reservoir for these bacteria that otherwise would have been taken care of by the body's immune system. It's it's almost like they're just a you know the building blocks that are that are needed for for the cancer to thrive. It's just this to me is a much better argument for bloody intelligent <laughs> design than any other ridiculous. So argument what what, what sort of? You know what um, I mean? It's it's almost just. You, what, you mean like um? What's the word I'm looking for? 
how it seems almost tailor made yeah. to help the cancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, well, it's ama- it just amazes me. And and I just, <laughs> I'm just thinking of the team when they discovered this. It must have been such a huge moment of oh my god, we just, you know what I mean? Like they talked about how how many tests they'd done to try and figure out why these <laughs> these cells. And, and I guarantee you that it was probably done by a PhD student who who was told, yeah, you've contaminated your sample. Do it again. No, do it again. Do it again. No, no, I've done this now 50,000 times and it's still the case. (laughs) Oh, maybe there's something in this. Ooh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, you're right. It it, it would have been months and months, possibly even a couple of years of absolute frustration, someone beating their head against a brick wall until someone thought to say, well, wait a minute, maybe this is something else. And then they basically they found this out by filtering out the bacteria. You know, make, and that's when they figured it out. Oh, okay, now this is. We've stopped the effect. Oh, right. It's, and mycoplasma is a weird one because it's a very small bacterium from memory. It's it's not like a typical infectious agent, like in terms of a big rod or a cockroach or something. It's I think it's got no cell wall at all, so it's a weird sort of nebulous kind of thing. So, yeah, anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just it's very. I, I found this story quite scary, and, I, and, I, and obviously, you know, no one wants to get cancer, but yeah. you know, <laughs> um, it makes me not want, want to get cancer even more, I guess. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I do wonder how many other cancers are will be affected by something like this and obviously it'd be a case where bacteria can as Lucas said get from the gut for example into the cell in, into the tumor site or from the blood so somewhere where it's got an easy passage and because your immune system is so whacked out during oh. cancer anyway it makes it easy but still I do wonder how many cancers are affected by this yeah. Well, it could be much more widespread because, I mean, we're surprised that they found the bacteria in uh, the pancreas in the first place. And also last week, there was a paper published in Nature Communications that found bacteria in uh, the fallopian tubes of a number of women. And that's some, something that, again, we'd never expected to find that. It's usually a fairly sterile place. So there's cancer pop- uh, cancer. There's bacteria popping up all over the place where well, we're not expecting yeah. it. And this I mean, is we just- are basically... We are basically bacterial colonies. I mean, I mean, the, the, I think the common number. I think that there's a commonly flaunted number that says I think bacteria outnumber our cells by a hundred to one or a thousand to one or something. I think that's an overestimate, but it's still. It, it is. It was recently revised to now about equal. Equal. Now, now think about that for a moment. Like that's actually. It means that you're half not you essentially. Yeah. Like half, half the cells in your DNA in mm. your body don't contain your DNA. <laughs> so that means essentially you are a walking. Bacterial colony. It's, it's kind of... Yeah. yeah. Disquieting is one way of putting it. Yeah. Who serves who? <laughs> All right. Uh, do you want to talk about cow DNA? Yeah. Why, why the hell not? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, this is a study looking at... Um, I mean... When we look at evolution, we often think of something like the ascent of man and the, that picture of chimpanzees and then Australopithecus and then finally modern human. But evolution's a lot more messy than that, isn't it? And this is looking at how the DNA of cows, about a quarter of that can be traced back to reptiles. These are genes just jumping around from species to species over billions of years. Yeah, it's that kind of right. And it's not just cows to reptiles. This is actually this has much much bigger implications than that. Um, so I suppose I should go back and explain what a retrotransposon is or a transposon. I think so. It's yeah, it's basically a little movable piece of DNA, and it exists. If you've ever, if you've ever read Richard Dawkins' Selfish Gene, and I'm assuming a lot of our audience possibly has, or it's on their reading list. Um, he brings up this idea of DNA as a selfish element that only exists to propagate itself. There is no rhyme or reason to life. It all started with a piece of a molecule of some kind that self-replicated and was there just to propagate itself. And it made its way into bodies, etc. And again, its only function is to keep itself going. And that's essentially what a transposon is. It's a piece of jumping DNA that will move around genome to genome um, from place on the genome to another place on the genome, from plasmids in bacteria back to genomes, etc. Um, it's a really, if, again, if you believe in intelligent design, this would be another perfect way of looking <laughs> at it because it's it's essentially, you know, it, it, on, on its piece of, on its stretch, it has all the genes that are needed to excise itself from a genome, put itself into somewhere else. You know, and that's all it needs. It doesn't need, really need anything else. And it's interesting because they can also carry other things and that sometimes they will confer advantages to its host by carrying genes like, say, for antibiotic resistance. 
um, they have been known to spur the evolution of other animals, etc. And so they're not just, you know, little pieces of DNA that jump around and do nothing. They can actually have a, a profound um, effect on the evolution of creatures. Um, one interesting one that Ed was talking about was this one that was found in, it's found in cows. Now, it's found in about, it's, it's, it makes up apparently about a quarter of a cow's genome in different replicating form, in different forms, and it's called Bob B. Now, what's interesting is that they, they don't know where it came from, they don't know what its origin is, but it's found in rhinos, elephants, insects like butterflies and ants, um, and yeah, reptiles. So, and apparently the, so obviously like every, every gene changes over time, including ours. One of the ways we can look at evolution of a species or of, of different species is by looking at a specific gene and looking at how it's evolved over the, over the, you know, billions of years or millions of years. And that, whenever you see a tree of life, that's generally what it's based on. The change of one gene, one gene, how one gene has changed. And how it, how it's safe. So, for instance, for instance, the gene for you know a ribosomal RNA in an insect, how it is different to our DNA, or, or, you know, the gene our, our, our similar gene. And there's a homologue in both of those, and you can tell the relatedness of that. And that's what you see when you see a tree of life. And that's that works if you assume vertical transmission, which means you know from parent to child, parent to child. It does not work when you look at transposons because they don't work that way. They can, but they also can jump. And that's called horizontal gene transfer, which is obviously the opposite of vertical gene transfer. So how do they jump? Is this like well, when one animal eats another yeah, animal or something? Or, or when, say, like an insect bites an animal and then bites another animal, mm -hmm. it transfers that way. That, that's the obvious okay. way of looking at it. So... This, this research group from um, the University of Adelaide, um, the, specifically these two individuals, David Adelson and Atma Ivancevic, I hope I've pronounced your names right, um, they've looked at the homologues of Bob V in, Bob B, sorry, in a whole lot of animals and they've figured out that, yeah, look, the ones from cows and ones from reptiles are much more closely related than anything else. And how that is, who the hell knows? It could be, again, from a mosquito biting a cow then biting a reptile somewhere along the way. Um, and that's the thing. You can't, it's really hard to determine how these genes evolved and where they went to because you don't, horizontal gene transfer is not, is not um, particularly predictable. You know, you can't... Oh, yeah. So, you, like, there's a really great in, uh, uh, example given um, in this article. They say, look, for instance, say, say you had worm DNA... Um, and it was picked up by a virus. That virus then infected a bird, and then a tick bit the bird. Now, if you just if you just looked at the genomes of the worm and the tick, you would assume that the DNA that they share came from was that that was the origin. But the problem is that worm, ticks don't eat worms. Ticks don't bite worms. All right. So yeah. obviously you've missed the bird. But if you didn't sequence the bird, you wouldn't know. And that's mm. that almost deserves attention. Yeah, you missed the bird. Obviously, you've missed, you missed the bird. The bird. <laughs> <laughs> Make it the show title. You've missed the bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So th Done. that's that's where horizontal gene. That's where the looking at the way transposons have <clears throat> jumped between animal between creatures and how they've affected evolution. It, it's really messy because where the hell do you look? Like, how do you assume transference? You really can't. It's not like vertical gene transfer. We can you can sort of say, okay, we know you know that we know that the genes for um, making RNA for ribosomes came in a vertical fashion, like it wasn't transferred. But you can't say the same thing for transposons. And the problem is that transposons have affected evolution. Um, just by jumping into genomes and disrupting genes and messing things up, they've done all sorts of things. Apparently, um, um, in, our, in, in mammals, they've basically, the, the placental development was spurred on by a transposon element. I'm not sure how they figure that out, but... That is one example where this is, this is, this has been from a transposon. Wow. So. That is just. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, it is. Really I like cool. this. Yeah. I like this little paragraph in the, in this uh, story in the Atlantic. Um, when, uh, Ivan 
was it, what did we say? Ivan Sevic. Uh, okay, so I can't yeah. even say it. <laughs> yeah, did the same exercise for Bov B, which jumps between species horizontally. She got one of the weirdest family trees I've ever seen. It's like a window into a bizarre parallel universe where sheep are more closely related to cobras than they are to elephants, where kangaroos have more in common with bed bugs than with horses, and where pythons, zebrafish, leeches, scorpions, and sea urchins all belong to the same tight knit family. It was just <laughs> bizarre. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's and what's um another interesting thing another interesting part of this story is looking at a different transposal transposable element in humans called L one, um and this is what I meant when I had it, this is what I meant when I said it had other implications not just you know whether or not cows and reptiles hmm. have the same elements. Um, now L one is apparently in seventeen percent of our genomes or sorry it's, it makes up seventeen percent of our genome. Now a lot of it's ancestral and it just sits there does nothing. It's lost its it's lost its movable elements, but some of them can move. They've been implicated in things like cancer and schizophrenia. Oh. Um, and apparently L1 is in almost every single mammal they've looked at. Now, the assumption here for a long time was, well, it must have been in a common ancestor and it must have been transferred because, you know, they didn't think it could move. But it turns out that, no, it's it probably has moved. Um, Ivanchevic says it's probably jumped at least three times. Um, now, we know it's absent from platypuses and echidnas. Right, so, so Australian Ivan mammals jumped, that would have been separated. Well, all from. those all monotremes, basically. Oh, yeah. So, um, so when, whenever the that jump occurred, you know, whenever the, the, the lineage split off, either the transposon jumped in there, or um, it jumped from somewhere else. Like it, it, it wasn't necessarily from the same common ancestor. Hmm. So it's not it's not as clear cut as as you think. And again. Because these have such profound implications in evolution, you need, you kind of need to know what's happening. But how do you find this out? <laughs> how do you track the movement of transposons across across the millennia? You probably can't. Yeah. Because you can't account for every single movement, every single tick biting a by biting a cow, or, or even presumably right. bacterial infections or something might be another way of spreading yeah, ex- it. Oh yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah and that, and that actually bacterial bacteria transfer genes that way through horizontal gene transfer. So yeah. That's one of the perfect ways where that um, bacteria can confer antibiotic resistance to other bacteria, huh. usually through transposable elements. So yeah, it's it's yeah, and, and they they brought this interesting fact that you know because it's been spurred on by evolution. Sorry, sorry, the transposons have um, you know affected evolution. If you replayed <laughs> evolution, assuming the same environmental effect, assuming the same genetic mm. mutation rate, etc you probably wouldn't get the same effect because of transposons. So that's another pl- place where Voyager screws up majorly. <laughs> it's, not- <laughs> it's not all about Star Trek. <laughs> I just got to chuck that in. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but that's, yeah, it's, it's. I, I find these things amazing. Um, and the idea that, and like, again, Dawkins, as much as I hate to admit it, was right. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the selfish gene effect comes here very, very effectively. Like it's demonstrated perfectly with transposons. They exist only to further themselves, and they will jump from species to species. They don't particularly care. As far as they're concerned, it's DNA. This is another one of those cases where the more we learn, the more we learn we don't know stuff <laughs> and how complicated yep. uh, something like genetics or evolution is. It's mm. it's just made uh, opened up a whole lot of new doors of uncharted territory to be explored, which is good. Well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, transposons have been studied for years. Mm. Um, I think they were probably, I think they, were, I can't remember exactly when they were first identified, and but they've been used for years. They've been studied for a long, long time. I just don't think people understood how powerful they were as a as a driver driver of evolutionary change. And now we're starting to get that picture, and it's kind of scary because it means you can't really predict it, or like you, you know, you you look at the past and say, well, this evolution that occurred. Was it just vertical gene transfer or was it a whole lot of other things that occurred? You say that's scary. I think that's exciting. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Scary yeah. is in terms of, I think to, to an ordered scientific mind, that would probably, <laughs> that would probably Concerning. make a lot of people sort of, it, it would, I, I reckon a lot of evolutionary scientists would not be able to sleep at night. <laughs> not about this too much. But yeah, you're right. It's fascinating. So. Right. Well, I think that's our show. Go to scienceontop.com slash 279 for all the links to the stories we talked about today. Leave us a comment there or on our social media sites. And of course, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. 
Once again, a big thank you to our Patreon subscribers. Just go to scienceontop.com slash donate to be one of the cool kids. Thanks for joining me today, Shane and Lucas. No worries, Matt. You're welcome. This episode was edited while surfing on a gravitational wave by Marcos Benamou. He wishes. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Now, remember, this is one of the first big discoveries from our gravity wave telescope. Remember, the Nobel Prize was given just last month to three physicists who created a new kind of telescope, a gravity wave the telescope. Wow. This is one of the first discoveries from that telescope. Now, we have light telescopes that were given to us by Galileo, radio telescopes that can see galaxies, mm -hmm. but now with gravity wave telescopes, we can see the interiors of black holes, neutron wow. stars, maybe even the origin of the universe itself. The ultimate question, which shall be answered soon, and now we know where gold came from, and it wasn't the jewelry store on 47th Street. Dr. Michio Kaku, thank you for being here. Glad to be on. You're always golden in my eye. My golden eye.